Hi, it's The Wire. It's October 19th, 2024. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, there is a fight coming up, and it has, in my opinion, one of the shocking lines in boxing. Right, let's be clear here in looking at the heavyweight division. The Alexander Usyk Tyson Fury rematch right now has Fury as a plus 145. Now, folks, that's simply preposterous given that the first fight went the distance. Fury hit the canvas in the first fight, was able to get up and still only lost that first fight by one point on the third judge's card. Let me also point out, too, that in my favorites folder, I have a Hall of Famer, Lennox Lewis, who talks about how he believes he would beat Usyk because Usyk gets hit by uppercuts. Keep in mind, before the first fight, I said Usyk was the betting side of the play. Here, the plus 145 makes Tyson Fury the betting side of the play. I thought Usyk was very heavy on straight lefts. Look at the film of the first fight, straight lefts. So let's just do the boxing math. If Tyson Fury believes what Lennox Lewis believes... If he goes back and looks through films and starts asking, asking himself questions such as when Usyk was backed up by Derek Chisora, I still feel Chisora does the best job against Usyk, was the uppercut there? Right? If Tyson Fury, who is ambidextrous, you didn't see it in the first fight because he doesn't feel comfortable going southpaw against the southpaw. But just understand, this is a guy with a lot of angles against a shorter southpaw who's very straight left centric. The question is whether Tyson Fury could set it up. And you need to think about this, right? Because Fury, of course, is physically bigger than Usyk. And Fury is one of the better heavyweights of our time, we need to ask the question, would Fury have lost that first fight if he didn't hit the canvas? Right, the question is whether Fury can throw a beautiful left uppercut. Why a left uppercut? Because he would then be able to use his right hand for defense against Usyk's straight left. Let me also say too that you know, where does Daniel Dubois hit Usyk in the body? Go back and look at the amateur fights involving Baturbiev and Usyk. What's Baturbiev's primary line of attack? It's to Usyk's body. Right now, Tyson Fury's a big man. The question is whether he can come out with a different dynamic where he's throwing body shots, he's protecting himself from Usyk's straight left. So he's going to have to be left hand heavy to Usyk's body as well as to try to set up the uppercut Lennox Lewis is talking about. Fury himself believes that he needs to stop Usyk in part for political reasons because there's a groundswell of international support for Ukraine after it was invaded by Russia and because, of course, Usyk's had other problems, um, in part due to the fact that he's a man who can't go home because of the ongoing war. So uh, just understand in my eyes, yes, I thought Usyk was the betting side of the play before the first fight. Just understand... The odds right now are preposterous. One of the base bets I'm pursuing is the plus 145 on Fury simply to win. When you get greater than even money odds on a prop like that, 
that enables you and keep in mind that the prop is a wide prop in other words fury wins by knockout you collect on the prop fury wins in the early rounds you collect on the prop fury wins in the later rounds you collect on the prop fury wins by decision you collect on the prop in other words a plus 145 controls the fury side of the ledger when you get outsized odds like that on an all-encompassing bet that allows you to cherry pick other props that'll protect you if Usyk wins the fight if it happens in a way that you believe right so I know Fury was down on the canvas in the first fight but I thought Fury was dominating the early rounds I believe that fight's gonna go several rounds I don't believe Usyk is going to be able to come out and chop down the tree early. So, understand, you have an opportunity here. If you get the plus 145 to then be in play, to bet overs. And these days, these casinos have algorithms where they'll give you multiple over-unders. You don't even have to be clever. If you believe in a rematch, the fight's going to go a few rounds. Fury is going to be better prepared for Usyk's stamina and his straight left. Then that plus 145 opens the door to an over bet that you're comfortable with. It also opens the door to round group betting, where if I believe that Usyk can only win by stoppage in the last third of the fight, and let's remember, in the rematch against Joshua, Usyk does not come out aggressively. He does not come out looking for a knockout. His mindset was to be cautious, even after dominating. That's what it was, the 12th round against Joshua in the first fight. If Usyk comes out with similar restraint for the rematch against Tyson Fury, I believe you can fleece the casino by taking the over as a hedge off the plus 145 or by taking Usyk late in the fight with an idea that, you know, as long as it's either an Usyk late stoppage or the fight goes to a decision, you win. So take a look at that. Now let's talk about my theory that no matter how good that Peturbiev Bevo fight looked, and it was a special night, folks. It really is a major fight of the year candidate for this year, right? Uh, and this year has had some noteworthy fights. You hear me talking about Usyk Fury. Um, as good as the fight was, and as interested as His Excellency is in having a rematch, and as loud as Eddie Hearn has been in saying his guy was robbed, I don't think we get a Peturbiev Bevel rematch anytime soon. Right? Who was the mover in that fight? Who had the better legs? Isn't it Bevel? If you're Peturbiev, what incentive do you have? And I mean this seriously. To fight a mover who gave you problems, who many people, myself, Carl Frotch, um, you know, Sean Porter, believe won the fight. What incentive do you have for a quick turnaround? You've already fought the man. His name's already on your resume. No one can claim you avoided him. You have political cover. Roy Jones has come out and is backing you. You have another group that's come out and said, hey, look, you know, that fight looked like a draw to me. In other words, the decision wasn't that out of line. Nobody likes the 116-112. Right? But just understand, politically, and I feel Bevel won the fight. I didn't like the decision at all. But politically, Baturbiev has cover. Right? It wasn't like Bevel steamrolled him. The fight's close enough where you have some greats who you know, don't believe the scoring was out of line. Right? That's the Roy Jones position. You also have a situation where 
fans don't fully get the economics of the sport. I know His Excellency is paying a lot of money or would pay a lot of money for a rematch. Right? But just to understand, there are other considerations. Right? The first one is if Baturbiev has two fights, including one that's easier than fighting Bevel again, if Baturbiev's group has looked at the film and they believe, and Baturbiev now is undisputed, that certain mandatory challengers are made to order for him, that he'll be able to find them in the ring easier than he would find Bevel. That these contenders don't have Bevel's level of hand speed or defense. Then why wouldn't Paterbiev do the math and think to himself, you know what, I can fight this mandatory. Who's going to criticize me for fighting a mandatory? Understand the IBF has already stepped out of the background and has said, you need to fight our mandatory next. So if you're Baturbiev, you're thinking, you know what, I can beat this mandatory, and then I have a chance to fight the winner of Baturbiev Morel. Where else is the winner going to go? Understand, too, you're dealing with, you know, Riyadh season, and they have power. They can say to you, hey, this fight's going to be in Riyadh. Right? Doesn't Paterbiev at this stage have enough market leverage to fight a mandatory where he wants? So he can fight a guy who's more beatable than Bevel in Montreal, in Canada, in front of fans in a venue where he can sleep in his own bed. His family can see him. He can hang out at his own neighborhood. He can be home. So the key question here is, and let's just imagine the purses. Would the purse for a Bevel fight be bigger than the purse that, and the comfort that Paterbiev could get from fighting the IBF mandatory and then fighting Benavides? Right, folks, if in fact the Bevel fight, which is high risk, Baturbiev's only opponent to go the distance with him to date, if the Bevel fight is more of an iffy affair, then Baturbiev has to ask himself whether the premium he would get on that fight is worth the risk. If his corner feels that he would beat both Benavides and Morel, as well as his IBF mandatory, as well as the other mandatories out there. There might not even be a financial incentive to fight Bevel any time within the next two years. Think about the Canelo blueprint, right? Career blueprint. Canelo reached a point where he wasn't going to fight Golovkin, even though the first fight was a financial success. He wasn't going to fight Golovkin again for some time. Canelo looked on the, ca on the calendar, no doubt, and thought, hey, Golovkin's older than me. He's in his 30s. What's the harm in me waiting a couple of years to fight this guy again? So, of course, Canelo waited a little bit. An argument can be made that Golovkin, particularly the Golovkin of the third fight, wasn't the Golovkin of the first fight. Right By the time the third fight rolled around, Ryota Murata had given Golovkin the business for part of their fight together. Right, Golovkin comes back in that fight, but just to understand, you know, Golovkin, by the third fight, wasn't the Golovkin who showed up for the first fight. Right now, you're Baturbiev. You know that legs are the first to go. 
you see that Beevil has exquisite timing. You also suspect that there is a possibility that Beevil might be thinking about retirement. Beevil, after all, is 33 years old, older than Marvin Hagler was when he walked away from the sport. Right? And so, if you're Beterbiev, and if you don't have a significant financial incentive to fight Beevil, if you know that your corner was serious when they said to you in the 10th round, you need a knockout to win the fight. If your group knows how close you came to losing. The question then isn't, can I beat Beevil in a rematch? Right, folks? Officially, you've already been credited with beating Beevil. And there are many people who believe that that was within the range of possibility based on the fight that happened. Right? Beevil scalps already on your resume. Are you better off fighting Beevil and possibly losing to Beevil in a rematch? The first fight's a classic. Or are you better getting other paydays? And two years from now, then deciding, okay, I'll fight Beevil. I understand. Baturbiev would be in his 40s at that time. But Baturbiev's game is a pressure game, isn't it? He's not relying on hand speed. He's relying on stamina, power, and pressure. Power is the last to go. It's Beevil's game that might drop a bit in the intervening time period, isn't it? Let me also say too, I follow some interviews of people who are well positioned in boxing. One of them is John the Iceman Scully. Now, Scully used to be online commenting on fights. You know, um, he would respond to videos on YouTube, for example, years ago. Now he's one of the chief people on Team Baturbiev. He's having a feud right now, believe it or not, with Gervonta Davis, who appears to have taken exception to some Scully comments, and Scully is one of boxing's best interviews, that if Davis walked away from the sport today, because of the caliber of his opposition, Davis, who is unbeaten, 30-0, 28 knockouts, would not be a Hall of Famer. So, of course, after the Bevo fight, Gervonta Davis issued a statement that he believed Baturbiev was overrated. Right now, of course, it's safe for a guy fighting at 135 to say that about a guy fighting at 175 because they're not going to get in the ring together. Well, just to understand, Iceman Scully has given interviews where he has said that Baturbiev would not hesitate to fight David Benavides. They consider it to be easy work. The one thing I can guarantee you is that Benavides wouldn't be moving like Beevil moved, right? Who Benavides has sparred with. So understand the mindset where boxing is right now. If Baturbiev were to fight Benavides, that's a huge box office fight, folks. Neither guy is going to get poor getting the paycheck from that fight. Right? Understand, as I make this video, Benavides is unbeaten. If Baturbiev <laughs> were to fight Canelo, that's a huge fight. Right? Canelo, clear first ballot Hall of Famer. I believe both Baturbiev and Canelo are Hall of Famers at this point. But Canelo is a clear first ballot Hall of Famer. Canelo might have that Ray Robinson mindset. When Ray Robinson was ready to walk away from the sport, he decided, you know what, I'm the middleweight champ. Let me jump to light heavy to fight Joey Maxa. Let me have that one last fight where I'm going to jump up and wait to prove something to myself. 
maybe Canelo is of the mindset that, hey, Baturbiev is highly thought of right now. I would be the underdog in that fight, which Canelo would be. That fight, legacy-wise, carries less risk than me fighting a Terence Crawford, who's viewed as a smaller guy than I am. Forget the heights, look at the girth. Right? I believe Canelo would be favored against Crawford because Crawford would be the one moving up in weight. So a Canelo could say, let me try to hit another level of greatness in a fight where I know I won't have to go looking for the guy. The guy's going to be right in front of me. Right? Just understand, Baturbiev has options if he does not fight Bevel next. And of course, if Bevel continues winning or if Bevel takes a step back from the sport. Well, that Bevel fight is always there for Baturbiev, isn't it? Right? Baturbiev could fight Bevel after he cashes the paycheck for fighting Benavides, who the Baturbiev people believe they beat. Right? Understand, too, he has the cover that all undisputed champions have. Baturbiev, after he fights the IBF mandatory, I'm sure is going to be approached by the WBA, maybe the WBC. They're going to say, hey, what about our mandatory? Right? Baturbiev can say truthfully, well, I have a mandatory. I'm going to fight that mandatory. We understand that there are rules for exceptions where you ask for an exception to fight someone else. But understand, if you're granted that exception, you still have to get back to fighting that mandatory. So, let me just say, after a classic fight, where, in my opinion, Baturbiev was fortunate, and I mean fortunate, to be awarded the decision, I don't believe Baturbiev fights Bevel in his next fight. I think Baturbiev might actually keep Bevel waiting. I believe there's a distinct possibility, since Bevel, in my opinion, is a first ballot Hall of Famer, that Bevel might make the same decision that Marvin Hagler made, that Andre Ward made, to leave the sport. Right? He'd be leaving the sport on a high note. Because that fight was the kind of fight we'll be talking about 10, 20 years from now. Let's get back to Cavante Davis. Now, let me just say this. Um, Davis did have a huge fight. Well, one I consider huge. He fought Jose Pedraza. He was an underdog in that fight. This was how he got the title years ago. I was expecting him to lose that fight. And he won that fight. That is a big notch on his belt. Right? To me, that was a big fight. Let me just say, too, that Gervonta Davis's reputation is going to grow if people he's beaten go on to do big things. So believe it or not, a huge portion of Gervonta Davis's reputation, his bona fides for the Hall of Fame, is how successful Ryan Garcia is when Garcia returns to boxing. Understand that Garcia victory, we can call it tainted, we can call it, you know, weight-influenced, because Garcia didn't even make weight for the fight. Uh, but that victory over Devin Haney was huge for Gervonta Davis's reputation. Because as I make this video, Garcia has only lost to one man. And it was Gervonta Davis. And it was a clear loss. There's no judging controversy for that fight. Davis knocks him down. Right? Ryan Garcia 
waits a second, and then goes to the canvas. Davis clearly wins that fight. So Ryan Garcia is a cash cow. I know Oscar De La Hoya in his clapback video made the point that the uh, fight uh, between Ryan Garcia and uh, and Devin Haney only netted 300,000 pay-per-view buys, right? Well, let me say most of the sport can't get 300,000 pay-per-view buys. Understand, too, because... Brian Garcia won that fight. Garcia's next fight, if it's against a world-class opponent, is almost certain to get more than 300,000 pay-per-view buys. So let's say Ryan Garcia comes back. He couldn't make weight when he was an everyday fighter. Now that he's older and coming off a suspension where he hasn't been able to, you know, keep a regimen where he's having fights every day, I believe Ryan Garcia comes back at 147. So I'm a skeptic here again on whether a Ryan Garcia Devin Haney fight takes place at 140 again. I'm a skeptic on that. Let's say the guys decide to enter the ring because Devin Haney yo yo's in weight between fights. So let's say they get together. Let's say Boots Annis, who's the best, at 147. Let's be clear on that. But Boots has a certain height, has certain physical attributes that leads me to believe that it's just a matter of time before Boots ends up at 154. I know his group uh, wants you to believe he's going to stay at 147. We have to make hard decisions here. Right? Understand, too. A lot's going on at 154. More, it seems, than is going on at 147 right now. Boots, if he were to jump in weight, might be able to get more interesting fights. So Ryan Garcia, if he returns at 147, if he faces Devin Haney again, but this time at 147, right, I'd be leaning toward Ryan Garcia. Assuming, since he's coming off suspension, that he looks in shape, that I'm not seeing a lot of flab, that it looks like he's been in the gym several times a week, right? That, you know, he looks sharp. Sometimes you have to guess on all of this, looking at the guy at the weigh-in, right? You see flab, you say, no, 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 not for me. The guy shows up looking like he's in shape, you say, okay, okay, you know, if Ryan Garcia beats Devin Haney in a rematch, or if Ryan Garcia up at 147 is able to fight, you know, the Mario Barrioses of the world and win and look good, right? Let's say Keith Thurman comes out of yet another, you know, lengthy period of time outside of the ring and fights Ryan Garcia. I believe Thurman's a Hall of Famer. And let's say Garcia beats Keith Thurman. That's going to shine a bright light on Gervonta Davis. Now, what to me won't are his next two opponents, right? Lamont Roach, folks, I have barely heard about him. You mean to tell me with all the talent at 135, William Zapata, Shakur Stevenson, I'm supposed to get excited about a Gervonta Davis, Lamont Roach fight. I understand they had competitive fights as amateurs. That matters a lot to them, no doubt. They know each other, no doubt. Right? But folks, if we're talking about the highest distinction in the sport, if we're talking about the Hall of Fame, you really do need to face meaningful opposition. Let me point out, Bevo is the only man to have beaten Gilberto Ramirez, very important person in boxing. Ramirez now has a cruiserweight unification match scheduled with Chris Billum Smith. Ramirez is also talking about going up in weight, right? His journey to the heavyweight division eventually. Understand. 
as the only man to beat Gilberto Ramirez, Bevel's reputation is going to have extra shine for everything positive Gilberto Ramirez does. If Gilberto Ramirez wins the fight against Chris Billum Smith, and if he then decides, you know what, I'm going to declare war on Kevin Lorena and the Bridgerweight division on my way to the heavyweight division. And understand, this was a big guy for 175, right? I believe Ramirez is a Hall of Famer, right? And I don't say that lightly. I don't believe everyone's in the Hall of Fame. But look at Zerdo's body of work. Certainly, if he becomes a unified champion at cruiserweight, that's not only going to help his chances, that's also going to shine a bright light back on Bevel. And keep in mind, Cruiser's 200, light heavyweight's 175. Right, so let me just say, I think Gervonta Davis beats Lamont Roach. I think Gervonta Davis beats Conor Ben. The problem Gervonta Davis is going to have, and it's something he needs to address, is that Many of us feel he fought Ryan Garcia too early in Garcia's career, right? Garcia wasn't the world beater that Zepeda is right now, that Shakur Stevenson is viewed as being. Right? Understand, too, Mario Barrios tried to step it up against Keith Thurman and got beaten by Thurman. Right? Who are the big guys who Gravante Davis has fought. Isaac Cruz, unfortunately, and I believe in Pitbull, he lost the recent match, looked bad in it, got outboxed methodically in that fight. Understand, Leo Santa Cruz, smaller guy, for a Gravante Davis who actually at one point beat Mario Barrios. Right, Davis hasn't fought. Jack Catterall, Teofimo Lopez, these guys are contemporaries. Regis Progre, the guys at 140. Right, so while I believe because of his unbeaten record, because of his box office ability, which really shouldn't be considered when judging a guy for the Hall of Fame, but you and I know popular fighters get things their way in political votes. Right? I do believe Gervonta Davis is a Hall of Famer, assuming he beats Lamont, Roach, and Conor Benn. But, you know, I'm still puzzled exactly at what Conor Benn has done to be considered as a viable opponent for Gervonta Davis. Davis at 29 seems to be having a career where you know, he is maximizing profits, not necessarily fighting the toughest guy out there. I'll, I'll give him credit for fighting Frank Martin, who was unbeaten. But Martin, of course, doesn't have the name that a Shakur Stevenson has or that a Teofimo Lopez has, right? At the end of the day, we really do judge guys by their biggest fights, right? You know, you think Ali and you immediately are thinking Joe Fraser, right? Um, Ken Norton, George Foreman, um, Ernie Shavers, Ron Lyle, all the guys Ali fought in the 70s. You think Ray Leonard and you're thinking Wilfredo Benitez, Roberto Duran, Thomas the Hitman Hearns, Marvelous Marvin Hagler, Right, you, you really do summarize a guy's career by, let's say, the three or four biggest fights the guy has had. Right, you think of Andre Ward and you think of Kovalev, you think of Carl Frotch, you think of Mikkel Kessler. Right, who are the names you think about when you think about Gravante Davis? Right? Understand, with Devin Haney, Haney actually fought Loma, didn't he? Right? Haney fought Regis Progre. I'll just say, 
those are names that are not on Gravante Davis's resume. I think he's a Hall of Famer. But let's just say the criticism of him not fighting his toughest contemporaries that have been raised by guys like John the Iceman Scully have some validity, don't they? Let me hear from you in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.